house. I grew up on the farm, but I didn't want to be there, so I stayed away from the animals. Uh, it's an honor to be here with so many wonderful people. Uh, today, a question was asked to me, how does it feel to be elected to the Hall of Fame? And I said, just think about it. We have four million people in the in the, in the state of Louisiana, about four million people, and only 400 people have made it to the Hall of Fame. That lets you know what a select group of people, how fortunate you are to be in that. This, being in the Hall of Fame is not something that I dreamed about. I could remember back in, uh, the, the 8th of June is a special day for me also. I got married on June 8th, 1980, so it's a special date. And, you know, my wife, when she was alive, she always told me that, uh, you know, to take care of the kids. Do everything you can for the kids. And I tell you, when Doug mentioned what we did not have at Southern, if I had thought about myself, I would never be a Hall of Famer because I would have quit and not even do anything. The day I walked in the office to take over the job, everything the baseball program had was in a shopping grocery shopping basket. Everything they owned. You talk about a jolt. I sat in the chair, reached right back, and took a deep breath in. What can, said, what can I do? I had a good friend, Dusty Baker. We played together with the Braves. And I called him, and I told him my situation. He said, We'll be in Atlanta this weekend, you come on in. My wife and I, we got in the car, we drove to Atlanta, and we got so much equipment, we had to U-Haul it back. You know, and that's how I got started. You know, a lot of people are afraid to ask for what they don't have. It's healthy to, to let people know what you, you need something. You're more inclined to get help, and that's what I, I've done in the community of Baton Rouge has been very, caring and loving, because they knew my situation, and the thing is, they knew what I did for my kids. My kids had to do community service. We made them do community service. And we did so much in that community. The kids used to love going out because they now they became a part of the community. And the, the community responded by helping us a great deal. So, uh, like I said, I'm here today simply because I had great players. You know, the parents, the mothers in particular, cried in my shoulder when I went into the inner cities of Chicago and Detroit, Atlanta. They cried when they gave me their kids and said, make a man out of my son. That was time mothers didn't pay their rent to send money to make sure that the kid would stay there. Those are the kind of kids that I coach and society had literally given up on. And we turned those kids into responsible young people. 80 some percent of them graduated. Now they're head of household, fathers, husband, making a great contribution to communities all over the world. Because I got to the point where I recruited all over the world. In, in 1999, I had kids from five different continents on my team, five different continents. And I did it all with $3,000 with $3, budget. When I started in 84, they had a $3,000 recruiting budget. When I retired in 2017, the budget was $3,000 recruiting. <laughs> Isn't that a great story? It's a great story. <laughs> and you know, again, if you complain, you're never gonna get anywhere because you waste too much time, energy, not doing what you need to do when you're complaining. So we made sure our kids never complain about what they didn't have. I always told them, remember you do have this opportunity to change things, make a difference, make yourself better. Those are the kind of things, it was great. And the other thing I wanna say before I leave was every day I had to tell my kids a true story. They would always say, coach, give us a true story. And it became so big that, you know, I didn't have anything written down, but I had to give them a true story. The reason behind the true story is there are coaches who do lie to kids to get them to play good. And I always tell the thing about Ronnie Reagan, won an Academy Award playing Newt Rodney, winning for the Gipper. Well, the Gipper was never in. That's not, that was a lie. 
but I would never tell my kids a lie about winning for the Gipper because I told them about a story that one day they may read and they'll say, Coach, telling me the truth. Coach is telling me the truth. And so many kids now call me and say, thanks for telling me a true story. Those stories have made a difference in our life. And everybody in here, we all can make a difference in young people's lives. You don't have to be a coach. Just be a good person, a responsible adult. You know, I'm going to say this and leave. There are a lot of people in the street asking you for money. And I don't give him. My son would say, what, Dad, why wouldn't you give that person money on the street? I said, because he's not going to do the right thing with it. Yesterday, I was in a place eating, and a gentleman came in and said, sir, would you buy me something to eat? And immediately, I went and bought him something to eat. And the lady said, what a beautiful gift you did, just did. I said, he asked for something to eat. He didn't ask for some money and go buy drugs with it. He asks for something to eat. So that's the kind of decision you have to make when you're doing good things in the, in the life. So, Doug, thank you. Well, thank you for guiding us along a very noble path. Let's talk about the baseball path that Southern's program took and how it happened to coincide with the rise of another program a little further south of you along the Mississippi River. You and Skip Bertman were kind of tag team partners. Talk we, about that. We were. You know, when I got the job in, in 84, he and I met at a place, and uh, uh, I told the story like a couple of days ago. We didn't buy anything. We were drinking water. You know, <laughs> we sat there, and we drank water, and we talked. And the one thing that came out of it, he said, Bad Ridge is big enough for you and I, big enough for Southern and LSU, and we're going to do community service together, and we're going to do things. And he said... We'll make this a better place. Remember, he wasn't selfish to think that Baton Rouge was all his. He wanted to share it. And there was a, there's something about someone wanting to share something because it didn't affect his program. It only made it better. And it only made Southern better. And the community became better because we worked together. There are so many wins for you, but certainly one that stands maybe above the rest, but certainly near the top of any list is that victory in the NCAA tournament against the number one team in the country. Can you remember that day and remember that feeling when the last strike was called and the Jaguars walked off winners? Well, Tim Brando is going to be here tomorrow. Tim Brando interviewed me that Thursday before we played, and he said, asked me what was it going to take to beat Cal State Fullerton, and I said, Oh, they're coming to New Orleans. I hope those California, California boys goes on Bourbon Street and stay out all night. And I say, secondly, I want it to be 100% humidity. And it's hot. Well, we got the humidity. And then my kids went out. And by Tim Brando said, there'll be a cold day in hell or somewhere if that happens. And my wife heard that interview and she was angry with Tim. I said, don't worry about Tim. I said, those guys do that kind of stuff. She said, yeah, but he was trying to embarrass you. I said, don't worry about it. Well, the team goes down to New Orleans. And the pitcher who started for me hadn't started all year. And he did a Muhammad Ali thing all week. He was talking, give me two runs and I'll beat him. And I said, oh, my, here we go. So we give him one run and he made it stood up. One run and we beat him one nothing. And the thing about that was the legendary coach, uh, 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 Garrido, I can't say his name right, but he and I became friends after that game. You know, he, uh, he recommended me to become on different boards because of the character of my team and the way they played in a big game against a top right uh, notch team. So. That, that big victory helped LSU should go to that first college World Series. <laughs> Augie Garrido may not, his name may not be your uh, one that you can say easily. He definitely knows how to say Roger Cater. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> uh, questions from the audience for Coach Cater. Yes, sir. Coach, I know you, one of the players you coached was a guy that is going to start coming up with his name being bounced around for this Hall of Fame since he just retired a couple years ago. Was Ricky Weeks the best player you ever coached? Well, we have to say he is because I coached a lot of good kids, and I coached another kid who played with Ricky, 
uh, named Michael Woods, who was just as talented, but did not have the work ethic Ricky Weeks had. Ricky Weeks had the discipline. He could go to work and do things alone. He didn't need a teammate to do it, and uh, that was his strongest suit, and he was the right guy. You know, just like Jackie Roosevelt Robinson was the right guy to be the first black in MLB, Ricky Weeks was the first guy, was the right guy to win the uh, Golden Spikes Award at a historical black school because he did all the right things. He did exactly what I asked him to do. And I told him back in 2000, if you work hard, if you work hard, you can be anything you want at Southern University. Rich, Ricky had a speech impediment and he said, I'm going to work hard because I want to be good. That's all I needed to hear. He wanted to be good and he did exactly. And I gave him the kind of instruction he needed. And what I did every day, when I got in my office at eight o'clock, every day at eight o'clock, I got on the call, I called people all over the country telling them about Ricky Weeks. There were some people who were very negative because we were a historical black school in a historical black conference and they said negative things and I said, you're correct maybe because you don't know. Remember, I could have been angry but had I been angry I would have closed listening ears. So I allowed listening ears to be open but I let them be negative and I kept putting positive in their ears. And then it came time for voting and Ricky Weeks by a landslide, win the Golden Spikes Award, Player of the Year, won five awards that year, all by landslides. Y'all, we could have a Roger Cater press conference and fill up there's <laughs> two hours without any question. And we'll, <laughs> well continue the conversation. This. There's no question about that. The great baseball coach from Southern University, Roger Cater. Thank you, Bill. <laughs>